If that way we don't take away from all the great stuff you have to show. So uh, I want to thank all the TPS teachers for logging in. Um, so environmental dashboard was something that was in the district up until a few years ago. Um, we had teachers across the district that would use the resources in their classroom to all kinds of varying capacities. Um, there were lots of trainings that were involved in it. It was super popular. And then there were some, I don't know, I guess I'll say technical issues that caused it to be shut down and unavailable. And uh, Mr. Peterson has graciously um, been working to revive the platform and make it available to TPS once again. And, and since this is a new platform based on the old one, we wanted to pilot it at one school before we rolled it out to the masses. So Bowser will be the pilot. That way I can support anybody that is piloting. And what you can expect to see, super brief overview when you get in the platform, is Bowser High School building resource usage data. So actual real-time data of the electricity, the water, and the natural gas that's being used by the building for the purposes of educating the students. And in addition to all that good data and various types of graphs and tables, um, there's also a, a large collection of educator resources to kind of give you some lesson plans and ideas to help support you in initiating it. Um, I think that pretty much sums it up. So I'm going to uh, send, I'm going to turn it back over to John. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for um, for for coming and attending today. I can't tell you how excited we are to be sort of restarting um, dashboard within Toledo Public Schools. I'll say a little bit more about the about um, our history of working with uh, TPS instructors, which was enormously gratifying for me a little bit bit later. But I want to just quickly introduce um, our our team. Um, it's not our full team. Can you guys see my screen as I go into slideshow here? Okay, and and did, you guys should have received a link to um, an agenda for today, and I'll pop back into that, but that little www.e-site backslash uh, tpspd1 is um, is an agenda that has a bunch of links that we'll be using today. Can pe could people find that in chat? I'll, I'll put it up on the screen a little bit later too, but did people find that in the chat? Yes, no, maybe. Is that opening for people? I wanna hear at least someone who says that that works for them. I'll, I'll stick it in, I'll stick it in again, but it's um, it's a URL that um, that takes you to and a, an agenda, but mostly it's actually a bunch of links. People access that okay? I just want to make sure. Yep, I'm viewing the agenda and I see a few okay. people logging on. Wonderful. So um, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, teaching and learning with uh, the new TPS dashboard today. Our uh, goal um, for this workshop, but with all of our students, is really to try to use um, real-time data on resource flows through school buildings to engage, educate, motivate, and empower STEM, STEM learning and action. And so I'm hoping to get you guys excited, as excited as I am about the opportunities um, uh, to do that. Uh, today. So first thing I want to do is just say a little bit about uh, about who we are. Um, I'm my my normal gig is as a college professor at Oberlin College. I've been teaching at Oberlin uh, since 2000 uh, in environmental studies and uh, and biology. My backgrounds as an ecologist, but a lot of my work has focused on um, uh, data visualization and resource flows through uh, buildings. Uh, Megan and Maddie are both with me here today. Uh, Megan is the project manager for Environmental Dashboard, and Maddie works as a designer for um, Community Hub, which is a, a company that we started to make 
dashboard available to other communities and schools. We have a whole team of software engineers working with us. Gaurav Bora is our chief technical officer on that. Russ, who I thought might be with us today, um, has done a lot of workshops in Toledo. Um, he's our outreach and marketing person, but he actually has had probably as much to do with um, our initial round of TPS installation as anyone. He used to work for Palmer Energy Consulting, uh, who's a partner with us on this project. And then we have these characters, Flash, the Energy Squirrel, and Wally Wally, who you will meet as we progress um, through today, but they're also important members of our team. Um, thanks so much to Elizabeth and Julie for their work in um, trying to get us restarted here. And to you folks um, for joining us today. I do want to ask you folks a little bit about how you think you might use this technology or thinking about using it, but I'm not going to ask you to do that until we've had a little bit of time to play with the technology. And I should mention, you guys should feel free to interrupt me at any point and ask me any questions you want about anything I'm showing you, and I'm happy to be diverted. What I hope is that I can kind of do a, show you kind of what we're doing a little bit and then leave a bunch of time at the end for, for a little bit of brainstorming on, on ideas for how things might be used in your class this classes this spring. And then, you know, just for, for Q and A on this. Um, so I've already, I think everyone has successfully opened the, um, the agenda. Uh, maybe I'll take just a moment to um, pull that up on my screen so I can, I can, uh, I can let's see, let me drag this over into here because I think I'm sharing this window. You guys are looking at this agenda right now. Is that right? It's, it's, uh, it's pretty limited, a little bit of introductions here. I'm gonna go through um, buildings as learning laboratories and introduce the dashboard, and then we can get right into that. But these links are gonna be important um, for today. So um, you're gonna to wanna to have this open so we can use those to, to navigate to the, um, to the dashboard. All right, so I want to actually take a moment to um, to just ask folks the 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 um, the question: When you think about an ideal STEM experience in your classrooms, what are the key components of that? I just I want to I want to get folks sharing at the start so we can think about how the work we're doing might fit with the work you're already doing. Um, thoughts on on ideal STEM experiences? I think it's something that's real time. It's not just something that's in a in a book or something that they have to research, something that they can that's tangible, something that they can see and okay, feel I, around them. I love that. See, feel, tangible, real time. Um, I'm getting experiential from that. That's that's awesome. Other other thoughts. Uh, my ideal is when students are able to ask questions and then design nice. experiments or do research to answer the questions. Right, I I have to say that's close to my own definitions. Yeah, other thoughts? Well, um, we've, we've covered some ground in those. I'm gonna give you my definitions, which are 100% consistent with, um, with yours. For me, STEM learning is all about research and discovery. It's very much what Elizabeth was saying about students being able, being in a position to develop questions and then answer questions. And for real deep science learning, it's about asking questions for which answers are not already known. You know, a lot of the work we do with students is obviously guiding them through experiments where we as instructors already kind of know the the answers. One of the really exciting things about what I'm going to show you today, and maybe sometimes a little bit scary and uncomfortable things, is um, the data that you're going to experience with your students often um, is uh, raises questions that we as instructors can't necessarily instantly answer because we don't know why it's doing what it's doing. Um, so we engage in a process of discovery with our students 
which I think makes it much more exciting for our students, for them to know that we don't know the answers and we're in this ex exploration with them trying to figure out how to, how to answer those questions. Uh, obviously connected with that is, is the issue of problem solving, try, trying to gather information that can be applied in ways that build knowledge and develop skills. And for me, um, one of the central aspects of science for me is the idea of storytelling, that, that science is a particular way of telling stories. It has certain rules regarding the evidence that you can include in that storytelling. But at the end of the day, um, we're trying to take what we've learned and convey it to other people. And so for me, uh, data analysis and data visualization, being able to combine those in ways that help convey information from one person to another person together with words is just central to the whole process of um, explaining how the world works. And at the end of the day, hopefully engaging our students also in figuring out how can we make the world a better place um, through the process of science. So again, I think everything I've just said is, is consistent um, with what was shared previous to that. Um, but I wanna, I wanna sort of think now about a bit, a, a bit of a shift here. Yeah, we wanna empower, empower people to be able to take action. And that is to talk a little bit about buildings because the data we're going to make available for you folks to use is on buildings. And you know, students often ask me, why do you care so much about buildings? And the answer to that from an environmental perspective is that us North Americans spend over 90% of our lives in buildings. And most of the decisions that we make that directly affect the world are made in the context of buildings. Buildings require lots of energy to run. They have a big through flow of energy, of, mat of material that makes them possible. And they degrade high quality energy into low quality energy and they create waste that needs to be either recycled or disposed. So that's true of any building, including your quite beautiful um, high school here. But if you look at the statistics writ large for buildings in the United States, buildings are responsible for about a third of total energy consumed. That is that that energy is consumed within uh, residential and commercial buildings, including schools. Um, 67%, so two thirds of the electricity consumed in the United States is consumed by buildings. And um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, about a third of the total greenhouse gas emissions produced in the United States are produced uh, by activities that take place in buildings. And this, this last statistic is one that I still find shocking, and that is that 9% of global greenhouse gas emissions are associated with activities that take place in buildings in the United States. So if, if, if we're interested in helping to solve the major challenges of our time period, well, a lot of the decisions, important decisions, take place within, um, within the built environment. Uh, also true for, for water consumption, 12% of water is consumed within buildings. So central point here is just that buildings are really important um, to, um, to, the, to, to our human impact on the environment. But the flip side of that, and what excites me so much about um, the work I've been doing for the last 23 years is that you know, we usually think of the buildings, uh, of buildings associated with schools as the places in which learning occurs. And what we've been trying to do is operate with the notion that school buildings themselves can serve as laboratories for learning. That is the resource flows through the school buildings can be a central part of a curriculum that develops um, smart environmental decision makers. So our goal, again, for 23 years now, has been to use real-time data on building performance to provide authentic learning experiences that develop STEM skills and knowledge for a more sustainable uh, future. And um, I hope I can convince you about how neat the opportunities um, are with this. 
So with that as kind of a preface, um, I want to uh, leap on almost immediately into exploring the new dashboard we've been developing for you, uh, and then consider um, the, the PD workshops that we have ahead of us and envision some of the teaching opportunities uh, for this year. Uh, before we go into the dashboard, I do wanna say a little bit more about our ex experience working with TPS. Um, mostly with the help of um, Elizabeth and Julie. We actually had our first discussions way back in 2016, um, uh, where we began to work on getting a dashboard into, into Hawking's. And then in 2017, we held a PD workshop. It was uh, funded by the Ohio Environmental Education Fund in Oberlin and had several TP, TPS teachers participate in that workshop. That include teachers from uh, CMSD in Akron and Oberlin. And then we began running, running our first workshops just for TPS teachers in 2017, and then really ramped that up between 2017 and 2019. And we had teachers doing some of the neatest um, different uh, things in their classrooms. We had one teacher who evaluated energy use and then had her students writing letters uh, to try to con convince people to uh, convince uh, local uh, government officials in Toledo to conserve energy. We had all sorts of different and creative things that were, that were done. Um, unfortunately, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, uh, due to nothing, nothing to do with teachers, but unfortunately the contract for maintaining the a data display system was, um, was done through the facilities folks and the facilities folks ended that contract in 2019. And um, so that was kind of the end of that, unfortunately, which is terrible because we we're really just ramping up in terms of education at that point. Uh, but uh, Robert Mendenhall has said that if we can get a group of teachers who are excited, um, we'll build a contract with Community Hub, which is a, um, a misspelling there, which is a new company that we started um, to sort of replace Lucid and make this technology less expensive and more focused on education. Um, so that's, that's what I'm representing today. So without further ado, I actually want us to go ahead and click on the first link. So what I have here is a screenshot of the TPS dashboard and some of the data visualization tools within it. But I want us to actually escape from this. And if you click this top link to TPS dashboard, you should open directly up to um, a page that has data on your school. And wow. um, I wanna make sure everyone gets there before I do anything else. Wow. Are we there? Everyone okay? Anyone having any problems? We good? I, like I say, I want to make sure mm -hmm. there's no one having any problems. Everyone good? I'm there. Okay, great. So um, this is what I will describe as your prototype dashboard. So um, uh, over the last year working with, uh, with Bob Mendenhall, um, uh, we, he sort of said, well, let's do another proof of concept, make sure you guys can create a dashboard that does what it needs to do, and then see if we can get teachers excited about it. And our first contract was actually just to access the data. We're getting data through Palmer Energy, which is a, uh, a company that, um, that uh, TPS still uses to, um, to manage some of the facilities, but, but we actually access their data every five minutes and bring it into our data engine. And, um, and then we create data visualizations. Now we are still at the starting age, stages of developing this. So you're seeing a set of data visualization tools here, but um, we're in the process of building a lot more tools. And by the time we meet with you in January, there will be more here, but I just wanna show you some of these tools and then have you play with them for a minute and, uh, and, and and then we'll talk about that a little bit. But I want one thing, I, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of, of hopefully it's pretty self-explanatory, but there are a series of different schools here that you can, um, you can navigate with and they all have their own dashboard. I, I made the link open up to Bowser School, but you can see, you can compare 
Bowser with some other schools in there. If you guys had particular, if you guys, if it, those of you who commit to doing the PD, if there are particular schools that are missing from this, we're actually accessing data and storing data from about 30 different schools right now within TPS. So we are storing a lot of data and we haven't built dashboards for those schools yet. If you were super excited about a school that's not here and you let us know, we could probably add it to the list by January. This is just the first ones that, um, that we did. So let me just explain to you a little bit of what's going on here. This is, is time series data. So this is the last seven days worth of data on electricity use in your school. Again, we capture it every five minutes. We've got this little character gauge here who exhibits different behaviors. This is, this is Flash the Energy Squirrel. Flash exhibits different behaviors depending on current levels of resource use relative to typical resource use. So the squirrel is happy. And for some reason, you guys are using a lot less energy today than you normally use. And again, I don't know what's going on in your school, but you guys can probably, I mean, well, it makes sense why you wouldn't have been using much less energy the last several, several days just because of the Thanksgiving break. But you seem to be using much less today than you normally do. And I, I can't, oh, this is Sunday. Hold on, let's look at, um, let's look at the last 24 hours. You can see, you can choose different time scales here. Um, and uh, this, by the way, is an anomaly. It didn't really go to zero. That's a, a little bug we're cleaning out. Our, the data we're getting from Palmer is not 100% perfect, so we need to filter it a little bit. Um, but you can see you've used less. It's a typical pattern today. It went up in the morning at, at 6 a.m. It's it's going up and, you know, it's it's beginning to go down now in the afternoon. But you can see it's it's not that far from, from typical use. Um, again, you can choose different time scales to look at data all the way up to the last 12 months, although I don't think we're I don't think we have a full set of data for all 12 months. Um, you can export that data as a CSV file if you wanted to examine it. This is is water data. Um, again, not surprising. It was low on low, although it was very low early last week. Were you guys off from school early last week? You had the whole week off? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. That would explain it because it, I, I, you know, in, in Oberlin, we had school on Monday and Tuesday, so it wouldn't look like that <laughs> in Oberlin on our dashboard. Um, but yeah, you can see it goes up a little bit during the days, but not the typical use. Um, all right. I want to tell you a little bit about heat map analysis, because a lot of this, again, is about how you can tell stories with data. So let me just quickly explain to you how heat map works. Every column here is an hour of the day. Every row is one day of the year. Um, and every individual cell is one hour of one day of the year. Um, so this is looking at the last 90 days worth of data. I don't know why it's starting with September. Let me look at the last 30 days here. Okay, so here we have November. And, um, this little scale up here is basically putting things into five different colors. Red means really high levels of electricity use, and dark green means the lowest levels of electricity use. And so this is a way of, um, of conveying information about resource use within your school that kind of translates into these colored patterns. And I want to ask you guys the questions now that I've explained this to you a little bit. What, how would you interpret these patterns of use? Why do you see a lot of red in sort of the middle and green towards either side? Why do you see all that green at the bottom there? How can you make sense out of these patterns you're seeing here? Anyone want to give it a shot? Times of day. So when every the, this when they're in the every, building, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Also, you can see the weekends because they're the red. Each red block is a weekdays, and then it becomes on the weekend yellow and green. Right. So you can see this is clearly a weekend here, just as you're saying. This is probably another. This is another weekend over here. Although there's something going on on these days on October thirty. October 31, 
October, uh, 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 November one, that looks a little bit different. Um, I don't know what that is. See, this is this is the thing. I don't know your school. I don't know what's going on there, but I bet you guys can tell me why there was something different on those days. Any ideas? October 30 through uh, November 1. Um, no, we were here. So yeah, that that's that's the weekend. That's why it's yellow. It's oh, not okay. Well, yeah, because Halloween. Yeah, because Halloween okay, was a this Tuesday. Is Sunday. So you yeah. had a Saturday when you had really high use in the in the morning for some reason. You see, who that? knows what those janitors are up to? Yeah. So and and do you guys have any idea what this what this Thursday November sixteen was about? Because you guys were just sucking energy down the whole day. You see that even at like. Uh, all the way through, all the way to midnight, you were just sucking down the energy. Maybe there were games or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, was that a Wednesday? Because we did have a game Wednesday. That's a Thursday. Thursday. That's a Thursday. But you see, this is the kind. Of, this is the kind of thing you can put in front of students and begin to ask questions. I'll give a, a tiny little anecdote here about an algebra class I went into one day. Uh, in actually in Oberlin High School. In Oberlin High School, we have, it's a little bit different. We do have dashboard, but we have sub-metering. So we measure, we can separate out electricity use in the auditorium, the lunchroom, um, uh, where else? Auditorium, lunchroom, gymnasium. So we've got some sub-metering there. So we've got a little bit higher resolution. But I walked into that class, and I was just showing the kids how to use this. And the kids noticed electricity use was high the night before and it didn't go down. It was not a typical pattern of use. And I don't know what goes on in their, in their school. And, um, and so I said, what, what, what's happening? And they said, well, we don't know. Let's see if we can look at where the electricity use was high. And they figured out, oh, it's high in the gymnasium. And within a couple minutes, they'd gone from, huh, there's some pattern here I don't understand to, I know what this is. This is a volleyball game that was going on last night. And pretty clearly what happened is someone didn't turn the lights off. And then thinking about, you know, we could have the janitor circle around at night and make sure the lights get turned off and take care of the problem that way. So within like, I'd say the about seven or eight minutes, at, at some level, I think they'd had their deepest STEM learning experience they'd ever had, where they'd seen data, they'd seen anomalies in the data. It had led to a question they'd look deeper into the data to answer that question. They'd answer the question. And as a bonus, they'd actually come up with an idea for management as a result of that. All of that occurring in about, in about seven minutes, them having that whole sort of like looking, noticing, questioning, answering question, and then formulating an idea about what to do with it. Um, so I'll scroll down. This is this is water use. So you'll notice it it has some different patterns. Although, um, let's see, this one is this month. This is last thirty days. Let me just make them consistent here, so that I have them lined up. Yeah, this is super interesting. That on this particular day, November sixteen, turns out to be super high for both electricity and water use. I don't. I have no idea what's going on in your building, but there's a good question to be asked there. Um, just to show you some of the other data visualizations we've got, um, we've got um, stacked bar graphs here. For some reason, um, and I think it's because water use is, is, is actually more accurate in your school. When we stack water use, we get almost nothing for the other schools and it's all in in Bowser, either you guys have a leak, or I think more likely the data is actually working in your schools and not working in their schools. But just this is just giving you a taste of some of the data visualizations that we have. I want to give you guys a few minutes to play with this. And the the single prompt I'm going to ask you is: Is there a pattern in the data that you think is interesting? and worth worth asking questions about. So take a minute to play with either the time series data for water uh, or electricity or these heat maps um, or the stacked bar graph. And I just want to give you a couple minutes to play. And then your, your assignment is to come back with a question, something you think is interesting 
and worth investigating further. You guys get with that? All right. So um, I'll, uh, we're on the clock, and you've got you've got three minutes. All right. What do you guys think? Anyone anyone got a, a good question they that that they see in the data? I can, can I call on you? It's unresponsive. So I just wanted to see if there'd be a difference. Like it did again. Uh page unresponsive, but like there's certain schools that um you know, with, that are STEM that have different start times besides the element, you know, besides the difference of the elementary and the, and the high school. Like I know Chase is, I think, a 15 minutes before and 15 minutes after, you know, difference, you know, would it make a difference? You know, I just was kind of curious about that, but it, it kept it's still saying that my page is unresponsive. But I just try, wondered if that, if that would make a difference. you try just hitting the reload there and see if that helps you? Let me see. One else had that problem. But I, I think the question you're asking, uh, Nicole, that's right, um, is, um, is would you see different patterns in different schools or as a result mm -hmm. of their different start times? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, um, that's actually, it's good to have these questions because that makes me think we got to make a comparison that allows you to directly compare because right now you'd have to sort of go back and forth between mm -hmm. some different schools, but it would actually be pretty easy for us to make it possible for you to do that within um, a dashboard so that you could overlay two different schools on top of each other. So that's something we can, uh, if you guys tell us what you, what, what the kinds of things you wanna look at, we can actually make those sorts of visualizations easier. So we can, we can make it easy for, to answer that sort of question. Um, who, who else has a question here? Uh, Keith, you wanna give us a question? <laughs> Well, yeah, I was just noticing, you know, all the other schools are elementary, so there is definitely their smaller buildings, less students. Um, but I was curious, the electricity, yes, we're a bigger building, but the water usage, that does look like maybe there is a water leak or something, because it is showing that there is something reporting at the other schools, just we are just way above what they are, though. Right. I think that you guys have the only working water meter because the, 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 the consumption is so low in the other schools. Although with that said, I will say we, we have an, in Oberlin, we run what we call Eco-Olympics competitions. The schools compete against each other to, to achieve the maximum reductions in electricity and water use. And last spring, we discovered a massive leak in the high school that we patched right at the start. And it was only noticed because kids were looking at, the, looking at it and saying, why, why does the school use so much water on weekends? You know, and there was no good answer. Tur turned out that, the, um, that there was a little electronic switch, a solenoid in the dishwasher that was stuck open. And when we shut it off, we calculated we saved 58,000 gallons of water during a two week period of the competition last spring. And again, it's, it was only noticed because kids were looking at the data and saying this doesn't make any sense. So um, we could definitely investigate water leaks in, in, in Bowser's. I mean, that could be a neat project for, this, for the spring to try to figure out what's going on with water. So um, that's a good idea. What about you, Thomas? You got a you got a, a question? Do I have that right, Thomas Patterson? I, I only have your names and, and the labels. I can't hear you, unfortunately. I don't know why. You're not muted.
And I don't know something something going on with your microphone because we can't hear you. What about you, Jeff? You're still muted too. I, yeah, it's really unresponsive, I think, because of that internet. So I just dumped a question into the chat. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, you're you're I am having trouble with your internet. How does electricity each school relate to enrollment building size square footage? That's a really good um a good question. One thing you'll um you'll notice is we don't have all the data for the schools. Um and so um Normally, um, once we get this data in, we'll be able to standardize data per square footage and per occupancy, but we don't have those numbers yet. So as soon as we have those, you'd be able to, I think Keith had mentioned that different schools have different occupancy, or maybe that was Nicole. I'm not sure who mentioned it, but different schools have very different occupancy. We could mm -hmm. standardize that by number of people or per square footage. So you could compare them on a per square footage level, mm -hmm. which is a more even playing field for that, that sort of thing. But that's, that's the kind of things that you, those are the kinds of things you can do with the, um, with the technology. Um, so um I definitely yeah. saw that with Beverly. You can see the difference in the elementary because I know from the ETR, it's like how many students, from, like it's such a huge school. And like you could definitely see the difference in the usage right. with those, even though they're all elementary, you could definitely see that. I mean, some things that I was wondering about in some buildings, would it matter if, and, and, and I don't know how far you want to tease it out, but I know some buildings may have um, assigned uh, restroom times and and assigned hand wash, you know, right. so would that make right. a difference versus someone who, where the building just goes whenever, or a building where they have assigned restroom times, would that affect that usage to a degree, or would it be worth even looking at? You just never know. I guess it depends on the building and what you're looking at, or what you're looking for. Right, right. Well, there's 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 something that um, that we've developed, and I think some of the teachers in TPS were using called the resource use signatures assignment that tries to get into that issue of like how do patterns dif differ in different um in different schools and how does that relate to management and to choices that people make so things like like in our elementary school you can always see blips of water when they have these sort of regular you know bathroom breaks between classes you just see the water spike up uh, mm -hmm. Because you know most of the water is being used in toilets and stuff, and obviously, see mm -hmm. around lunchtime, you see like a big surge in water use. So the mm -hmm. patterns are really different for different things, but they're different in different buildings too. And you know, you can engage students in trying to connect these mm -hmm. patterns of resource consumption with the particular activities in in different schools. So you know, there's great work to be done out of like helping students to really connect data with what human beings are doing, the choices that human beings are making, whether they be, you know, um, management choices, like, you know, sometimes you'll see electricity kick on at like six in the morning and you figure, okay, well, maybe they got lights and heating schedule to pop on at that mm -hmm. particular time, as opposed to, you know, bathroom use, which is, you know, people are really, human beings are really flushing toilets in that, in that situation. Um, anyway, hopefully, um, Elizabeth, you want to share a question or not? You're under no obligation to do that. I think oh, no, done. that's okay. I was just trying to sync up some events on the school calendar with water usage, looking for trends like with after school events and water patterns. And I found out something super interesting. I was trying to see if I could make sense of it. There was a huge spike in early November on 11 2. You're looking at the heat map? No, the Bowser High School water the, this the month. The time series? Okay. You're yeah, and there right. was a little spike at 10.07 on November 2nd where we were using 170 gallons per hour, which is like way higher than typical usage. So I was just, yeah, I was just trying to correlate events going on with the school with resource usage. November, November what? Way back Second. in time. So you went, you went way back. I went the um, month, yeah. Okay, let's see. Last. Oh, no, that's not going to do it. That's going to be way too long. Um, it uses different resolution data for the longer time periods. Um, 
Well, neat questions. And you were able to see a relationship there. You could you could see something. Um, uh, yeah, we got to do something about these too many numbers down here. Um, but you're someplace around. Where where are you, um, Elizabeth? Uh, it was November chart? 2nd. November 2nd. Okay. Um, let's see. That's right around here or something, isn't it? Uh, your screen's a little small for me to... Yeah. At any rate, neat that you're finding those patterns. Um, definitely exactly where uh, where we should be going um, with this, this conversation. So I hope you got a little bit of a taste from that. Um, I'll just I'll just say a couple more things before we turn into talking about um, the opportunity. So we've taken a look at heat map analysis, stacked bar. We do have some new um, uh, data visualizations which will be coming online. These are not showing. These are buildings on the Oberlin College campus. Um, this is called Portfolio Drift. It shows you different size. The size of the boxes here represents. Um, the total amount of electricity being consumed by buildings on our campus. And um, so the Science Center is using much more energy than anything else. And um, the color is how much electricity it's using this week relative to last week. So I'm just showing you this is another type of data visualization um, that we will be adding to the TPS dashboard. And uh, actually, this one is filtered just for dorms. Um, so it's the same same thing filtered for dorms. This is another uh, comparison that we'll be adding to. This allows you to, to compare various buildings. Again, you can sort of standardize them by occupancy or by square footage. Uh, the little lines here indicate whether they're using more or less electricity than they did during the previous time period. So this is comparing the last um, 12 months to the previous 12 months. And if it's if you see a green line here, they're using less electricity than they were otherwise. Again, I'm just showing you some of the other data visualizations which will be here. Uh, one other thing I'll just uh, show briefly is we do have a repository of um, lessons that people have developed. It's for the previous iteration of this technology, which was called Building OS and not Community Hub, but most of the exercises are going to work with the new technology as well. So just saying, there is a there's a set of exercises in here developed with teachers. Uh, but I want to I want to go ahead and move on to the opportunity um, in front of us, which is to do a deeper dive uh, January 11, um, and then you know the I guess the commitment and Elizabeth could say more about this is to do some sort of a lesson or exercise within your one or more classes that you teach uh, sometime this spring, and then we would reassemble for a follow up discussion. Again, you guys are kind of pioneering the reintroduction of dashboard into TPS, so we're hoping to learn a whole lot from your experiences. And I'll say that we, on our end, we're willing to provide lots of support to folks. So we're we're definitely available for consulting on the development of your exercises or lessons or, or things you want to do. And I wanted to put a, a couple specific ideas in front of you for things you might do in the classroom. Um, one is just, um, you know, I, I mentioned this idea of resource use signatures assignment. Again, that's a it's an existing assignment. We'd be happy to revise it so that it better matches the new technology. But just engaging your students in analyzing, evaluating, and comparing patterns of resource use um, within 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 schools. So that you know that could be a great exercise just in and of itself as a sort of entry point into that. That's something we've done with grades down to fifth grade, but something I do a whole lot in college classes. So I use that very actively in our Introduction to Environmental Studies course, which I teach at Oberlin. Been using that for years. Another opportunity, which I mentioned along the way, is um, you know we had this question come up about it looks like water use is much higher in Bowser than the other schools. And I'm telling you, I think your meters might actually be working and theirs might not be working, but we could do what's called ground truthing uh, meters. 
So what that would entail is um, on the electricity side, probably putting an electric heater in the building on, a, on an auto timer that would go on and off each hour over the night when the building is unoccupied. And then having your students compare the known amount of electricity use so we can attach a little a little metering device to that so we can know exactly what was consumed with what's online just to make sure that we're that the data we're getting from the um from the data system is matching the data that we've measured and we can do the same thing with water putting a water timer on a sink in there and letting it run at intervals over a night when the building's unoccupied and unlikely to be using water so we can make sure the gallons of water that are that are reading from the system are actually matching the gallons of water it'd be a really important thing to do in terms of helping students to understand that you know you can collect data but you also need to verify that data to make sure and having an independent measure of something to for, as part of verification is just part of any scientific process and then the third thing which would actually be great for us and i think also a really neat experience for students is you know we are redeveloping and developing new kinds of data visualizations and um, we'd love to run some focus groups with students where we would zoom into your classes, have students play with, um, with different data visualizations, try to figure out what they're learning, um, uh, what resonates with them, what makes sense to them, what doesn't make sense to them. Um, it would be really useful for us in terms of building a better technology that's more useful for your teaching. So that's that's these are just three thoughts on opportunities. You guys may have other different ideas that we would be happy to support um, uh, in in our work too. So um, yeah, that's I want to I wanted to make sure we have a little bit of time for uh, discussion of your ideas. Maybe we could maybe we could just ask you guys if you do already have some ideas that you're thinking about or if anything I just put in front of you um, resonates with you. But um, yeah, that's... Uh... Any thoughts? I like, I like what I'm, I'm, it's really, oh, Go I'm, ahead, Ms. Buckle. So I'm working with uh, an environmental, a couple environmental science classes here, and I was thinking about just having them go on like we did today and observe for patterns and trends, but then ask some questions that they would like to use the platform to monitor throughout the quarter and kind of see if the seasonal changes affect the resource usage or whatever direction they want to take based on their questions. That's great. Hey, Meg, are you happen? Do you happen to be taking notes? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Make sure you get these ideas down. Okay, that's great. That's neat, Elizabeth. Other thoughts? Nicole, you were different. gonna share something. I just, you know, um, it seems so far away to spring, but I know in some instances it's just like right around the corner, it'll be here before we know it. But um I, I'm I'm enjoying the um this is my first time teaching the environmental. So to have the new knowledge of just a textbook, but also to be able to use a textbook uh, and the standards, but also tie in the real world, the real time, you know, with what they're, you know, learning. That's that's the cool thing to kind of compare it. So you can kind of, you know, or maybe, maybe there's other experiments in the textbook that I just haven't seen yet, but that's really cool, you know, just to kind of, see that we have these new buildings and you always uh i definitely feel the effects of it where i'm at right now i'm right next to a window so what you don't see there's a, there's a blanket on my lap uh because i i can't escape this little air that seeps through these windows so you know but the kids don't see that because they're not in the building i teach i don't teach physically i teach for the va i'm just in Bowser. but to kind of see and maybe there could be something that uh, we're looking at it in our school, we're looking at it at Bowser, but how would you look at it in your house? You know, when you talked about the water usage and how you all found that that uh, that gauge or something that was off, that happened with my sister, how it was, her house was, was not even, no one was even in there. And with her two toilets, her water bill was higher than my parents' house that had four. 
So just how those little bitty things, you're like, wait a minute, and you found out it was a leak. So, you know, just, you know, to make it more real, real world, not just the building, right. even though it's cool to look at the building, you know, to look at their surroundings too, because that's their house is where they're learning at. You know, we're learning the right. building, but they're they're in their house also. So that's cool. You know, Nicole, one of the things that um that that struck me in, in what you were just saying is like you've got that heater on your on your lap right now. Mm. I believe your your building is heated with natural gas. So you don't see the building heating with um in the electricity use. You would see cooling. So in the summer, usually you see a lot of electricity use when the building when buildings are occupied that have any AC in them in the summer. But sometimes in the winter, when it gets really cold, you'll see spikes in electricity use, and it's almost always like the heaters on people's laps and like the um, the the little heating units that they have plugged into the wall. You mm -hmm. know, so when mm -hmm. it gets super cold, even though technically. The heating isn't supposed to be showing up in electricity. It actually does show up because people are just too cold that they've got their little heaters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got my heater, well, the heater's plugged up in a box right now because I'm like, Oop. but the blanket's on my lap. Yeah, so right. it's just kind of right. kind of weird, but it it you 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 do see the correlations. Yeah, yeah. Keith, did you did you have an idea you wanted to share? I was just going to say I'm a little different than everybody else because I'm a math teacher. And so I teach data science. And so right. I'm interested in getting the raw data and we use coding in order to make sense of the data. So we'll see if we can come up with some of our own graphs and things like that. Right. So that you saw that, that there's that little export CSV file. Um, yes, that's what I'll be there. using. And 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 we will be developing a data data downloader application that allows you to choose different resolutions of data for for downloading um so that you could you know you could you could you know download exactly what you want to look at that what the what the little csv button will do is it'll download exactly the data going into that graph but the data downloader will give you much more flexibility in terms of downloading a whole set of data if that's what you want to do so that's a possibility. Hopefully they might find the data visualizations within the dashboard interesting too, because they are they are pretty cool. But yeah, that's it's good to know you're interested in doing that because that would, again, the things that you guys express interest in are things that we can make sure we get set up so that you can do what you want to do. Uh, Thomas, I don't know if, you're, if your microphone is, is working or not. Maybe not. You're um you're you're muted now, but I we couldn't hear you before even when you weren't. Oh, there we go. You're you're muted. One more click. Yep. We can't hear you though. Alas. I don't know, it's something with your microphone. Um, I'm sure it was very insightful and they'll tell us when we get to school. I, I, I'm, I'm sure it was. So at any rate, do you guys have any more questions? I, I'm running, I'm running down on our hour. We got, we got, we got four more minutes. Any, any thoughts? Um, you know, if, um, you know, if we, love to have a, a, a bigger group if you want to help promo this to other teachers. Um, let's see, questions here. Um, Elizabeth, any final comments on your end um, about details with the with the PDs coming up? Um, no, I just uh, thought everybody's ideas sounded super interesting. I can't wait to hear how they end up working out. So yeah, in January, there'll be a two hour in person PD where we'll go a lot more in depth to give you everything that you need to know to be able to confidently implement your good ideas with your students. And then a follow up meeting early fourth quarter. That way we can report out and kind of help uh, John's organization drive this so it's successful when it's uh, go 
goes beyond the pilot into the rest of TPS schools. And we're certainly all grateful for you all jumping on and uh, participating in the pilot this year. And if there's anything I can do to support you as you use it here in the building, I'm happy to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys so much for, for participating. Um, we really look forward to working with you. And again, if, if you liked what you saw and you think there are other teachers who might be interested, um, you know, I think it certainly wouldn't be a problem having a bunch of folks join us in January who didn't participate today. And we will be uh, sharing and making this recording available too. So, um, yeah. Elizabeth, thanks for all your work in, in, uh, in trying to get this thing restarted on somewhat short notice. Oh, you're um, welcome. And then uh, I put a link in the chat. Um, it's like a blue sheet, but digital for your pay and contact hours. Um, I had put it on earlier, but I don't think it, editing was turned on. So if you haven't filled out your information yet, if you could please do so, so I can submit that to the district. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you. See you in a few months. Alrighty. Okay, sounds good. Here sounds good. Bye. All right, everyone. Bye bye. Take take care. How'd we do, Elizabeth? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. Um, it seemed like there was a lot of interest uh, from the people in the group. So I can already see the wheels turning. That's great. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe they can, uh, I mean, you know, we'd be happy to have it open to anyone, even if there are people outside of Bowser, you know, in some of the other schools. Um, I don't know if that's a, that's a thing or not, but um, it seems like we, we want to get critical mass of excited teachers here. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if one or two more from Bowser might jump on. I know one teacher cornered me right before break and said she wanted to come but was unavailable. So if I could talk to her about it. So and then we do have a, an environmental club here and I haven't been able to get a hold of that teacher yet. That might be something she might like to do with her students after hours. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, we had a we had an environmental club in Oberlin that was um that was doing stuff with the dashboard for a while. So that in the, in the high school. Cool. Well, thanks again for getting us, um, getting us set up. Um, I guess there's, I guess, uh, I guess we'll, we'll just be, we'll just sort of interact as we plan uh, for that. But um, you know, we're, we're planning on coming out there and um, hopefully, hopefully you'll be able to, get these folks and maybe some maybe some additional teachers to participate yeah we'll see how it works out i have a i think everyone today showed strong interest so okay cool great thanks so okay. much elizabeth if you're welcome thank you for your hard work putting this session together you bet take care bye-bye